Coming up on this episode of DL Weekly, the candy cane schedule has been posted. Make some holiday apple treats at home. A new pre-show for World of Color. New holiday decor for the hotels. Two milestone anniversaries. Mickey and Minnie turn 95. We talk to author Bambi Moe and more. DL Weekly starts now. Hello, everyone. Welcome aboard the DL Weekly podcast. Please lower your head and watch your step while boarding. If this is your first time listening, we hope you'll check out our website at dlweekly.net. If you have more time to spend, becoming an official weekly tier at dlweekly.net slash support is an especially good value. Thanks for traveling with us today, and we hope you have a happy and memorable listen to this week's episode. Hello and welcome to this episode of DL Weekly for the week of November 22nd, 2023. I'm Tag Bushman. And I'm Teresa Urban. We would like to thank all of our current weekly tiers, including Gene B., Michael C., Shannon C., and Aaron S. for supporting the show. Your support ensures that the podcast will continue and that we can make it to the parks more often to bring you the latest news and information right from the parks. If you'd like to become an official weekly tier, head on over to dlweekly.net slash support to sign up. In episode 222, we spoke to Debbie and Steve with Designer Park Company about their rope drop bag that was launching. And they've launched a bunch of new designs yes, and they've got they some have. other th- stuff coming out soon. So they've got a lot going on. I subscribe to their newsletter where they always talk about their new stuff that they have. But if you've been wanting to get one of these park goer bags for yourself and with the holidays coming up, maybe you know somebody who would like one of these bags. You can use our promo code DL Weekly to get 10% off your purchase at designerparkco.com. Well, with the holidays quickly approaching, we will be sending out postcards again this year to all of our supporters from the park hopper level and above. If you are currently a supporter on Patreon, please log in and make sure your address is up to date so you get your card. If you would like to get a postcard from us, you can go ahead and sign up and become an official weekly tier at dealweekly.net slash support. Now let's get to the news. The seasonal tradition of handmade candy canes is upon us. Disneyland has released their schedule for selling them this year at the Candy Palace in Disneyland and Trolley Treats in Disney California Adventure. Starting in December, the Candy Palace, again, that's Disneyland, will have them on the 3rd, 5th, 10th, 12th, 17th, 19th, and 24th. Trolley Treats over in DCA will have them on alternate days, so they will begin with December 4th, 6th, 11th, 13th, 18th, and 20th. And finally, Christmas Day. In the past, they have been $19.99 each with a limit of one per guest per day. I don't really have anything to say about this. I will let you talk about your enjoyment of the <laughs> I, candy canes. This has been this was something that was on both of our Disney bucket lists that we got to cross off in 2021. And we've just been very, very fortunate because the past two years that we have been to the parks for the holiday time have been reservation required times. And it just so happened that we had our reservations already secured for the park and then the candy cane schedule release and it just lined up perfectly with our reservations. And so it happened again. Year three, we had our reservations. They're lining up again with the correct. We're starting in the correct parks for the candy canes. So this year, Tag's kind of not, he's he's not a big fan of the candy canes. I enjoy them. I think they're fun and they're festive and they are different. But I really want to make sure to get one and grab one this year because when we're in the parks, part of my family, my parents, and then part of my extended family will all be there. And it'll be their first ever time experiencing Disneyland during the holidays. So I kind of, I want to try and snag a candy cane for all of them to try. Yeah. I under, like they're cool looking. I like the way like I, I like the pomp and circumstance that goes with all of the making of them and stuff like that. I just for me, I feel like it's more time than I want to put towards it. Like the payoff for me is not there. See, so. I, the thing that's surprised, I think for me, I have the opposite thought because I put it as this much crazy. Like I thought it was mm. like close to near impossible to try and get. And I tell you that first year the first day that we were trying to do it in disneyland it was it was nuts but we did our little candy cane shuffle from the gate back to the candy palace and that was a little chaotic but ever since that time it's gone smoother and smoother in fact last year when we did it i want to say we waited in the actual queue to get signed up for maybe 30 minutes 
And then it was an hour later, I got a text message saying that the candy cane was available to be picked up. So it was way more efficient. I do think there's something about when you're going, like if you're going towards the start of candy cane season versus the middle and end, I think the first time we did it was towards the start. So I think people were a little bit more like, ah, because it was the, the beginning, whereas maybe towards the middle and the end, there's not quite the same demand or same volume sure. of people going. I, yeah, I just feel like I could th- be totally this is kind up. of the, so we don't have this happen anymore. But for a while there, the first thing we had to do when we entered the park was always get a coffee. And I'm like, I want to go do something else. Yep. And so this is just another one of those like, well, this is another thing that has to be done right at the beginning Yep. where that prime time to like go experiencing that mm-hmm. have longer lines in the day is taken up. And I just don't think for me, the, the candy cane is worth it. I do think it's worth if people are excited about it, it's worth doing it once. I just don't. I mean, we've done it twice now. I don't <laughs> feel like I need to do it anymore. Well, Disney has some great eats and treats for the holidays, and the Disney Parks blog wants you to be able to make some at home. This time, they're focusing on apples. The holiday apple tart, the apple butter cake, the apple tart to tin, apple butter, and an apple pie cocktail are all at the link in our show notes. These look so yummy. So some of these are current recipes that you can find at any of the, some of the resorts. And then, so like the first one right there, the holiday apple tart is actually from Disneyland at the Tomorrowland Skyline Terrace. But some of these other recipes are from the Disney Recipe Vault, which did you know? I didn't know there was a Disney Recipe Vault. Of course there's a Disney Recipe Vault. But the two that are from the vault sound really good, though. The apple butter cake and apple butter. Yeah. I, these are things, if I didn't already have my menu set for what we're doing for the holiday this week, I would, yeah. These, I want to try these. I really do. Maybe sometime between now and the end of the year. This sounds really good. It's, yeah. Maybe that can be like, a bonus episode we can bring back like cooking the, the cooking oh, where you and i try recreating as as recipes freak my neighbor from the, out again. where you're trying to recreate recipes from the park <laughs> i would love to make this apple butter recipe yes. it doesn't look like it's too diff- terribly difficult Mm-mm. anyway very exciting Yum. obviously with this week being thanksgiving if you celebrate uh, happy thanksgiving to all of you listeners out there and maybe this will be some fun food that you can add to that mm-hmm World of Color Season of Light is back for the holidays, but this time with a new limited time short before the show. The short highlights the story from Disney's new animated movie, Wish. The show runs for about four minutes right before the regular World of Color show begins. See, I like that they do these synergistic Mm tie-in things. And something as easy as throwing in a few extra minutes before World of Color, I think that's great. I feel like something like World of Color is easy enough for them to be able to add and change and do these little things. Yeah. Almost as good as like the Bruno show in, on It's a Small World's facade. Like these things are not too bad and it uh, makes it, you know, you might have seen World of Color Season of Light before, but now you have like another reason to go see it if mm-hmm. you want to see this thing. Plus it promotes the movie really well. So yeah, it should be great. I agree. I think it's, I think it's so fun. While the holidays have been moving into the parks for some time now, there are new decorations up in the hotels and in downtown Disney. The Disneyland Hotel has gone for a mid-century modern look with whimsical decorations reminiscent of It's a Small World. It will snow in downtown Disney around the big tree that is located near the Jazz Kitchen and Splitsville every half hour from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. And, of course, the Gingerbread House has returned to the Grand Californian as well. I really, really, really want to go do a tour of the hotels again when we're there for the holidays. There's something... There's something about the style and the decor that they've got at the Disneyland Hotel that just, it just looks, like Tag said, very fun, very whimsical. They're I'm really, really buying really it in mid-century yeah. modern, which I'm here for. I really like it. There's like multiple trees. It's not like there's just one tree that's decorated. There's a sleigh full of presents. There's different window clings on like the doors and all this stuff. It just looks super cool. There, there's lighting outside. I think I even saw that there, the Disneyland Hotel sign like up at the road even has, it looks like snow has fallen on mm-hmm. it. They really have gotten into this. So I, this is very fun, very cool. And plus, I mean, snow in downtown Disney. That's a fun little magic moment to have outside of the parks. Absolutely. I love the Disneyland Hotel. It looks... Mm-hmm beautiful and i hope we have time to make it over there 
Well, two iconic parts of Disneyland have recently celebrated a milestone anniversary. The Main Street Fire Engine has been delighting guests and even Walt himself for 65 years. In fact, the last photo of Walt in Disneyland was with him and Mickey on the fire engine. Steve Dinley, the cast member who is normally seen driving the iconic vehicle, is celebrating 50 years at Disneyland. Steve started as a utility man in the Tomorrowland Terrace restaurant, then moved to Tomorrowland Attractions before landing on Main Street in 1984. So that means he's been driving that fire engine. For almost 40 years. For almost 40 years. Yeah. I think it's amazing because there's not many attractions at Disneyland that you associate a cast member with. I mean, mm-hmm. we used to have Maynard with the Haunted Mansion and then Maynard with the Tiki Room, yep. apparently Maynard at Great Most of Mr. Lincoln. I only saw him at the Tiki Room. But Steve is one of those people, we actually, three or four trips ago, actually got to ride the fire engine with Steve. Yeah, and uh, like... And it was really cool. There, we were the only ones on it, too. So we got our own private ride up Main Street with Steve. It was very fun. Yeah, I think if you've seen the fire engine, more often than not, Steve is the one who's been mm-hmm. driving it. So how cool that these two anniversaries line up. So it's 65 yeah. and 50 years. Like, that's yeah. just... What an honor, like, to, to be known for something like that. I don't mm-hmm. know. It's just... I love it. Well, a huge congratulations to Steve Mm -hmm. on his milestone of 50 years and almost 40 years with the fire engine. He is super nice. He's like the embodiment of like Disney magic. He's so kind, always has a smile on his face and is just wonderful to chat with. So if you've never chatted, stopped and chatted with Steve, I highly recommend you do so. He also, him and the fire engine got to go to the Rose Parade Mm -hmm. as well, which is really cool. Well, even though the Walt Disney Company's 100th anniversary was not celebrated at the parks for guests, Mickey and Minnie's 95th anniversary was. Commemorative buttons, photo spots, and a birthday cavalcade helped to honor the occasion. Did you did you see photos of this birthday cavalcade? I just, I don't know what it is. There's like this little mini float that they have that's this giant, like, animated cartoon style birthday cake. And it just makes me laugh. I don't know what, why... But it's just so it's just so like happy and fun and like crazy. It's like definitely was made in like the Toontown Bakery kind oh, of sure. style birthday cake. But I think this is so fun that they do these little celebrations to celebrate these milestone things in the park. Are we sad that they didn't do anything for the 100th anniversary of the park? Y- yeah, but I feel like that was a huge missed opportunity. But I am glad that they did do something to celebrate Mickey and Minnie's 95th birthday. Now, is this the outfit that they had yes. for Mickey's 90th? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. I was just curious because <laughs> okay. all that confetti and everything. Yep. Yep. I'm glad that it's they just, kept it's it. It's like their celebration outfits. By the way, did you notice in the photos that Vice Chat has that it is not Steve it is, driving no, It was the, not uh, Steve driving that day. The fire engine, but uh, I was yeah. very happy. I really like the style of the button that they had because it's kind of more of a, it's not the current style of Mickey and oh, Minnie, sure. the current cartoon style. This almost reminds me of maybe something from like the 80s or 90s. Sure. But yeah, it's kind of more of a classic Minnie, Mickey and Minnie. I like it. I'm glad that they did something. Well, last Friday, Star Wars Galaxy's Edge celebrated Life Day. Life Day is a holiday in the Star Wars universe for the Wookiees like Chewbacca. There is a lot of merchandise from last year and a special dessert at Docking Bay 7. We're just going to pretend that it wasn't merchandise that was dated 2022 that they had sitting out for 2023 Life Day. But they did have a special dessert at Docking Bay 7 that was sold out by the evening. I will tell you, this dessert looked pretty good. It was called the Kashyyyk Cake. It had a brownie base, raspberry sauce, tiramisu, and dark chocolate mousse. It does, yeah. It sounds really good. The photos that Disney had posted to like show this off looked really appetizing. I hate to say it, the photos that I've seen of people that bought thing. it that then took a picture of it the they had there were these round red discs that have kind of like gold dusting on it for some reason they rem- they look like pepperonis to me oh yeah. i think because now the, that you the, say that. the red in the, like the the promo photo was a deeper richer red than what these were it was almost more of a like yeah, like a maroon a little bit, but yeah, that I can't, I'm sorry if I ruined that for anybody else, but they, they just look like, <laughs> it sounds delicious, but that's all I see. Ooh, Life Day Cheese Branch at Katsaka's Kettle 
It appears to be a baked cheese breadstick dusted in spices. That could be good. Hmm. Well, something out of the ordinary happened on Main Street this week, causing injury to a few guests. Due to high winds, a light pole blew over in Town Square. After the incident, Disneyland secured other similar posts around the park with cabling to stabilize the poles during high winds. This was wild. That, I mean, it's one of those, I don't know, never what I think about that but of course why why couldn't that possibly happen because who knows how old these light poles are and what ended up happening is people had shared photos of the one that had fallen over you could see that the decorative base that just kind of goes over the top the post itself had was rusted Mm -hmm. down that down at the base usually there's you know like it's poured into cement and then it's you know there's a cement base it didn't look like there was a cement base and the grass went right up to it so i'm sure that's probably what caused the issue but again not something something that you would think there were reported injuries of guests so our thoughts go out to them i hope that you know nobody was seriously injured but i do think i saw that someone was taken to the hospital because of this so very scary so hopefully everybody's okay after this incident yeah not something I ever like considered that these Mm-mm. poles would like fall down or something. I do commend Disneyland for going through and putting up straps almost immediately yeah. of the other things. And I'm sure that since this incident happened, I'm sure that the maintenance and administration of the park are double checking oh, yeah. all of the la- yeah. lights and will make modifications mm-hmm. as necessary to make sure this doesn't happen again. Well, Dream Key Magic Key holders should have received an email notifying them of the class action lawsuit settlement. In the settlement, Dream Magic Key holders will get a payout of $67.41 for each Dream Key. A third party company will be contacting class members with details on how to receive their payments. Or I guess just payments, singular. I'm sure they're not breaking $67.41 into multiple payments. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, we knew this was coming, but I guess they're finally starting to actually like roll out, try to coordinate payments and stuff. Mm -hmm. So So if you had a dream key, magic key holders, be sure to check your email to to see if you got your notification. If you did not get your notification, make sure you check your spam. Absolutely. Well, with the addition of Lightning Lane to the Little Mermaid Ariel's Undersea Adventure, the entrance has been moved from under the beautiful entrance. To the other end, where most of the queue space is located. This is a much less glamorous entrance, but needed for the space required by Lightning Lane. This, okay, this has to be temporary, right? Like, I don't think so. It's... mm, Lightning Lane ruins everything. Yeah, I just feel like this has to be temporary. Because they should be able to split it. So that, because I'm thinking of how it usually goes. They've got to be able to split it. remember that's where the exit is, too. Remember, the exit yeah, goes out that way. But I feel like they'd be able to split it maybe past where the exit, like after you're under the dome, split it. Because when you're in the standby line, depending on how long the line is, you go past the door to then go into the yeah. maze of stuff to then go back up to the door. So I would think they'd be able, and it's usually a pretty wide space between the door. There's nothing between the door and then where the entrance is. They have that whole area is blocked off. Mm-hmm. So I feel like... You'd have a very short lightning lane that they they'd be able to split. They must have thought that that wasn't going to work. I wonder. This is my. This is my. You're looking, putting it out there I'm in the putting world. Putting it out there in the world. I think what they're doing is they're reworking the entrance area there. So okay. that's why, for now, I feel like this has got to be temporary. For now, you're going all the way down to the end and entering what doesn't look anything like an entrance because you've already passed the entire show building, it feels like. Right. I think they're putting something there to make a divide. Mm. I think they're installing stuff to make it... It should be able to work. I hope so. I don't like the entrance being moved down to that other area. And honestly, I wish they just wouldn't. But, you know, whatever. It's happened. Yes. DL Weekly announces the boarding of the Trivia Express, nonstop star speeder service to the moon of Endor. All passengers, please prepare for immediate boarding. Hello there, and welcome to Trivia Land. So, James, how do you feel about Snack Chat being built next door to Trivia <laughs> Land? Yeah, I mean, it's not like an, a land, so it's not like it's that threatening. See? Mm. Could have been Snack Land or, no, Foodie Land. That was the one I mm. had come up with. Could have been Fantasy <laughs> Fair. Oh, fantasy but, uh, Fair. <laughs> James is really excited that for was Fantasy good. Fair. It was a good name. Did I tell you about the one that we got submitted after 
the voting had already started. I think you might have, but you should tell me again anyway. Refreshment corner. Oh, like, yeah. Brilliant. That was, that was a really good one. <laughs> brilliant. We should have. We should have. But oh, well. The, oh, the people so have good. spoken. Snack chat. Yeah. All right. Whatever. You know, it, it's good to have more company. We always talk about wanting more expansion. So <laughs> uh, plus a few extra places to eat. Why not? There you go. But we're here for trivia. And so we're going to do trivia. I mean, I'd much rather eat. Can we just eat instead of doing <laughs> trivia? No. Nope. Do you want a taffy? No, no, I've had enough taffy. <laughs> For those of you listening, Teresa has been pumping me full of taffy since I got here today. So mm-hmm. I'm just waiting for the sugar rush to really kick in. Uh, I, my stomach's already feeling a little upset from all the sugar. But anyway, sorry, trivia. Well, let's get to the questions while you can pay attention. My first question for you this week is, where in the park can you find the home for Pfeiffer, Fiddler, and Practical? Ooh. Find the home? Yep. Well, it's on Buena Vista Street at Disney California Adventure. Yeah, I was going to say, it's the Starbucks. Yeah. It's the cafe. Yeah. I guess I don't know if that's their home or not, though. Like, are you saying, like, something different than what we just said? I mean, that would be me telling you the answer, wouldn't it? Oh, well. Is it Storybook My question land? says I'm looking for the home of Pfeiffer, Fiddler, and Practical. Okay. Is that the Three Little Pigs? I think it's the Three Little Pigs. So I'm going to say the Storybook, Storybook Land. Storybook Land. Canal Boats. Boats. Yeah. All right. That one in tow. We'll move are on we to open, question. Are we overthinking this? We might be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's the joy, right? Question number two is an audio clue for you. Oh. I have a short clip from an attraction. I want you to tell me which one it is. I have strong confidence in the two of you. I mean, it sounds like Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, like the last tunnel, maybe? It's definitely an outdoor and fast attraction. I heard water splashing. Can you play it again? Sure. There's so many noises. It's either Big Thunder Mountain or the Matterhorn. It might be the Matterhorn because like tink, tink, tink might have been like the the break. Yeah, that's what I'm, that's, yeah. That was what I was thinking. I was thinking the extra noises were (laughs) were, were the the bouncing around. What's tough is what you hear as wind, Mm -hmm. like on the microphone, Mm -hmm. I hear as rumbling. Oh, I heard it as wind, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to say Big Thunder. Are you going to say Matterhorn? And then, like, one of us maybe will be... And then watch it be something totally not any of those. (laughs) Locking in different answers. Both climbing a mountain. Moving on, our third question comes from listener Elise K. What year was the sword in the stone installed? Ooh. 83, when they did the new Fantasyland redo. I feel like it has to be. 1983, we'll go with it. Which I'm really sad they don't have that show anymore. So you're saying you think it was with the Fantasyland redo? 83, with the Fantasyland redo. But you missed the show with it, huh? Yeah, I do. I miss that they used to bring like kids and Merlin would come out. You know, they've got a Merlin. Just have him walk over from the parade. Well, with right, Merlin has his own shop in Fantasyland Mm. now. He is the star of the Magic Happens Parade. <laughs> the star, yes. <laughs> Mim hangs out in villains in like the, the Oogie Boogie Bash as as one of the villains. We need the show back. There's there's a, a resurgence of love for Merlin and Mim, so bring back Merlin. I love how you bring Mim into of all of this. <laughs> of course I do. Of course I do. Therese is just bitter because I finally got Lorcana cards this week and I got the Dragon Mim, which is what like a legendary, like no, really rare. Yeah, it's a rare yeah. Yeah. So I don't remember what I don't remember. I the sent name, Teresa the picture rare. thinking she had this card mm-hmm. and she was like, What? Yeah, it's super cool. Anyway. Moving on, our last question this week is a cast member costume. Oh. It's essentially a beige work suit. Pants with a belt, a matching colored shirt tucked in. The shirt tends to have one or more patches on it as well. If it's a little colder outside, cast members can throw a beige jacket over the top of it. And if it's sunny, some aviator sunglasses make the look. Oh, it's Soren. Kind of Soren, yeah. Originally, I was thinking... I was thinking the canoes originally. 
Oh, that would have been a good one too. But no, I was thinking uh, Jungle Cruise originally. Oh, but but if I, it wasn't for the Soren, aviators, you yeah. would have not had. We would have been going back and forth. I think. Well, he said like a what do you like a jumpsuit. Yeah, it's essentially like a beige work suit. Yeah, so that was making me also think like Soren or something. Because like, yeah. Oh, like, yeah. All right, that wraps up this week's trivia questions. How do you think TNT did? How'd you do at home? No, we're just a discussion topic away from the answers. Well, this week for our discussion topic, we are talking with, now wait for this title, this is kind of crazy, the former Disney music executive, which actually was the VP of music was the official title, at Walt Disney Television Animation, Mm -hmm. and more importantly now, the author of the book Part of the Magic, a collection of Disney-inspired brushes with greatness. You're not going to believe the name here, folks. Bambi Moe. Welcome to the show, Bambi. Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> Thanks so much. What a great introduction. <laughs> well, talking about Disney with a yeah. name like Bambi, like Yeah, I know, I know, I know. People, you know, that's that's actually that's a big part of this. Mm-hmm. You know, I was given it's my given name, but that is something the first thing people ask me, did you change your name to work at Disney? <laughs> and I said, No, do people do that? <laughs> you never know, right? You never you know. You never know. I yeah. Uh, well, we are but so I, excited. I will tell you something funny about the name, though, mm-hmm. being Bambi. I worked with a woman named Winnie, oh. and my boss's wife was named Wendy. Oh, So it was like we were get uh, you know, yeah. yeah. So anyway, the, names the Disney do, gals hanging out yeah. together. The yeah. Disney gals, all of them. <laughs> I love it. Well, Bambi, we are so excited to chat with you. Just so everyone listening knows, we actually met Bambi at the most recent Disney Anna event. She presented and showed off her book. We purchased our own copy. I've got it right here. But we're just so excited because your your career and all of the different brushes that you've had with Disney throughout your life is just really, really incredible. And we're so excited to chat with you more about it. Thanks. I I feel very fortunate and I am so unbelievably grateful for having had those experiences. And I just, uh, you know, it's really kind of been fun for me to revisit them and share them with everybody. Well, to kick us off, how about you tell us a little bit about your Disney story? So this will just be what kind of got you interested in Disney and or Disneyland. Well, you know, I have to kind of give really I'm I'm going to give 100 percent credit to my mom. Okay, my mom grew up during the Depression and she was a Depression kid and there wasn't a lot of joy. And, you know, as a a kid, but but Mickey Mouse and all things Disney kind of represented that to her. And she really carried that through her whole life, you know, as a as a kid and then as a teenager and as a young woman. So, you know, having had her own daughter. Because I asked her this many, many times. I said, did you name me Bambi because of Bambi? And she said, oh, no, 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 no. She said, if I was going to name you anything, it would have been Mickey. <laughs> 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 so my my that really is where my love of all things Disney came from. It was from my mom. But, you know, I, as a young Disney executive, I think one of my, I, I can't even tell you, it is probably One of the greatest moments that I could say that I ever had at Disneyland was when I was a young Disney executive and I was part of something that's called Disney. It was called Disney Way. Mm. And basically what it was, was a three day intensive. And I don't want to say training, but it was like a training where where you'd go to different parts of the company and you'd have different experiences to get to know other parts of the. Yeah. It's a really cool and smart idea, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially a company, you know, like Disney, very, very advanced and, you know, very culturally rich. And so one of the three days was getting to go to Disneyland. And one of the things that you got to experience at Disneyland was they outfitted you into a park character costume <laughs> based on your size and height and yeah. weight. Now, and they they don't, you know, they don't tell you in advance and they look at you, they look at you and say, okay, so by my weight and size at the time, they said you'd be great as Mr. Smee. Oh. Now, which is interesting from, you know, Captain Hook. So I, 
I, I try, I put on the Mr. Smee costume yeah. and I will tell you, I will tell you officially and unofficially, cause I don't want to get into trouble. Those costumes are hermetically sealed. I mean, you are sealed in. Okay. I am a person that discovered I'm claustrophobic. Oh, oh no. no. Oh no. So that was not a good costume for me. And if you think about it, the Mr. Smee head mm-hmm. really was proportionally. So it was literally really close to my face wow. on top of it. So I couldn't go out. Obviously, they're not going to send somebody out who's having a claustrophobic yeah, episode. Yeah. So what happened was I was so disappointed and I, I really, really wanted to to take part. So I got to put on, and this is very funny if you think about it, I became the white rabbit oh. from oh. Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. And the white rabbit's head is much, much bigger. bigger. It's like, yeah. a, it's much, much bigger. And it's away from the face. Mm-hmm. I put it on and I could do it. So this is the moment. This is when I fell in love with all the park and just the experience of being at the park. Because there's nothing like this feeling. You can't communicate. You you can't speak. You can't do anything. You go into the park. And being in as the white rabbit, I felt so much love from little kids and grownups and guys and gals and everyone just coming over and just wanting to hug or just be close. And I was beaming from ear to ear inside that costume. And I thought, whatever this is, this is the magic that makes Disney so great. And specifically Disneyland so incredible. Like I envy all the the people who have that job who get to go out in the park because you are really loved. That's amazing. It's it's magical. That's really That's amazing. Well, great segue. When you go to Disneyland... (laughs) On yeah. the first day of a visit or just on a day, which way do you go? Do you go left towards Adventureland? Left. You go left? <laughs> well, well, you know, it's funny because I, 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 I go in and I go by, you know, the firehouse mm-hmm. and I go by Walt's office and then I go straight up Main Street. Now, this is kind of one of those things where you share it and, you know, anybody hearing it, they go, wow. Well, I actually got to work at Disneyland, but not be not work at Disneyland. Two different occasions. One, as again, as a young executive, once a year, we used to go into the park from, if you worked at the studio, you went to to Disneyland and you had the opportunity to work as a server behind the scenes and serve the other cast members. Okay. I love doing that. I mean, I, it was so much fun slinging burgers and, you know, <laughs> Christmas time and at the at the Christmas party. It was so much fun. And it's really interesting because that's how you kind of get to know. You see a little bit behind the the scenes, mm-hmm. like where the magic, yeah. how the magic happens. So so that was really cool. And the other time that I got to work at the park. Was when I was at the record company. My first job was at at Disneyland Vista Records, which is now known as Walt Disney Records. And part of my job was to find songs for the Disney characters to sing on song albums. And at the same time, the company was the record company was developing a rock band, but it wasn't your normal rock band. I'm going to make reference to something that I hope your listeners will go and check out because they were super cool. But it was almost like the banana splits meet the Star Wars Cantina band. (laughs) That that's kind of what this was. Mm -hmm. And the name of this band, this rock band was called Halix. Now, for anybody out there that would remember Halix, they actually played that summer every night at the Tomorrowland stage. Oh. So, and the reason I bring it up since you asked the question, when I was working at this, I would work all day at the studio and then I'd drive down to the park at night. And that's when I would turn right. <laughs> so I'd, go, I'd go toward Space Mountain and the Tomorrowland Terrace. And that's where, that's where Halix was. And it was fantastic because it was a really great way to develop a, a band 
and develop an audience for a band and have the band itself get to play in front of a crowd every single night. So it was incredible. I don't even know. I mean, I felt like I didn't sleep at all because I'd like have to work all day at the studio and then run to Disneyland at night and, you know, go to, to whenever the park closed and then drive all the way home and then get back and do it again the next day. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Those were some so long was, days. Yeah, if you ask me what summer that was, I don't remember. I can't. <laughs> Why, I my brain's still tired. <laughs> I love Googling stuff. And yeah. so like you're mentioning this. So the Halix played from June 20th, 1981 to September 11th, 1981. There you go. And I was hired. I was hired and went to work at Disney. in I think my first week was February 5th, 1981. Oh, wow. So if that gives you an I timeline, an idea timeline, and you know, by the way, I mean, again, this is something I'm, I'm, there's a young filmmaker, his name is Matthew Serrano, and he created a documentary on Halix that is so phenomenal. It's on something called Defunct Land. Oh, I think yeah. That's on, you, you know, Defunct Land? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's on the YouTube and Matt Serrano is a talented filmmaker, and he poured his heart and soul into this this documentary that I'm also in, actually. Oh, and that's how I met him because he wanted to know about how did Halix, how did you know what was the my experience in in being involved in the creation of that. That's, so that's anyway, really cool. we will put yeah. a link in our show notes. So if listeners want to check that that documentary out to learn Great. more about Halix. Yeah, I see it right yeah. here. It's about an hour and a half long documentary. He does awesome. Defunct Land. He does a lot of these. Like he does a lot, form. but Math Matthew is actually Defunct Land was the the production the company that sure. put it together. But it, it's really Matthew's film, and he's he just does an extraordinary job. That's awesome. Well, I have yep. to ask part two of the of the Disneyland entrance question because people yes. have, it's become quite controversial lately. I suppose. Oh, so are not controversial, but like something that people always want to talk about. Uh, which tunnel do you go in? Do you go in the left tunnel or the right tunnel or does you switch it up? Wow. See, I, I didn't think about to... this either, but somebody brought no. it up and they were like, oh, I always go in the right side of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. And I realized I always go in the right side of the tunnel. So it was just kind of funny. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I don't, I, I think I'm, it, it kind of depends on what I'm doing. Sure. Why I'm there. You know what I mean? Yeah. At some point it, it changed, you know, when you work for the, when I worked, when I went as a civilian <laughs> before <laughs> I worked for the company, <laughs> you know, I think I had a different, obviously a different experience in going. Everything was just so, you know, mad. It was like, how do I get to anywhere as quick as I can? So that was kind of my goal back then. Mm. You know, nowadays the experience of going to the park is, 180 degrees from what I knew. Yeah. Right. So, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it, it's like I, 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 tunnels didn't kind of, they didn't matter back then. Sure. You know what I mean? Yep. And then it became it, less of an issue because when, if I was working on something, I was heading to a, in a particular direction. So. Sure. Makes sense. Yeah. Well, in, you know, since we're talking parks, what's your favorite attraction? So even though this is a Disneyland podcast, you can pick any attraction from any, any of the parks. Okay, I well, can I can I have more than one? You, of course, you can. <laughs> you okay. sound just like Teresa. So, yeah, nope, that's I'm the same way. <laughs> well, because this one really surprised. I had a, I had a, I, I again, I don't want to sound corny, but I had a magical park experience, yeah. and it was during the recording of our Lion King to Simba's Pride and title song. We were recording it with two incredible artists, Heather Headley, who you would all, you guys, everybody would know as she was Nala in the oh. original Lion King. Yeah. And she was all, she also won the Tony for Aida. Mm. So the major, major talent. Yeah. And another recording artist named Penny Lattimore. And so we recorded that song with the intention it was going to be the end title song on Lion King Simba's Pride. Okay, that was the name of it. Lion King 2, Simba's Pride. And this is this was amazing. We got to shoot the music video of the song at the Animal Kingdom oh. in the middle of the night. Wow. And my the moment of the something that was so special 
was the first time seeing the tree of life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It just blew me away. It was so spectacular. And I, I and again, the privilege of being at the park at, at, at closed in the <laughs> middle of the night. Oh my God, it was yeah. incredible. You know, I, it just, it's like, I, I, if I wasn't, if we weren't so busy working, I would have liked to have like checked things out more, but you know, and I remember our base station was at the Rainforest Cafe. Oh yeah. <laughs> which is right near there, you know, and like it, it was, uh, that was extraordinary. So I just, from a, like a, a moment, a visual moment at a park, seeing the tree of life was just unbelievable. But, you know, I I have to say, I, I'm a small world girl. Yeah. It's the small world ride will always be. I mean, you know, just from it, not just because of the song, but just because of its message, mm-hmm. you know. The history is yeah. incredible, too. It, the history of it is incredible. You know, and of course, we've got, you know, the Shermans and mm-hmm. the Shermies. <laughs> the Sher- Sherman Brothers, the the brilliant yeah songwriting team. You know, it's just it, it's they it's just an incredible mm-hmm. uh, ride and experience. Yeah. So I think I think that for me, you know, how could you not love the haunted mansion? Okay, how could you not? <laughs> I mean, and I even I mean during this I, Ter- Tower of Terror was like really fun. Yeah. You know, I I'm I'm a I'm a I'm such a park fan. You know, I mean, I remember. The first time going through soaring over California yeah. and California Adventure and smelling the the mm-hmm. the oranges and the oh god it just there's just so many things about being there that just is it it's you know it just I feel so lucky that I got to experience it when I did and that I still get to experience it and it's always a new experience like yeah. I just was there not that long ago and finally got to you know check out all of star wars land you know the and that's so cool yeah it's so it's amazing i will never forget the first time we were in galaxy's edge i was we were standing waiting for one of the attractions and it was pretty new like it it had just opened that year and i'm just standing there looking at stuff things like what i'm like this stuff looks so old and used but we know it's brand new like it was just messing with my mind how like grimy and like I was looking, it was a like a handrail or something that they made look like the paint had, it wasn't the paint was actually warm, but they made it look like it was. I'm like, this is, this is just unreal that somebody, a, you know, all these details is just crazy. It's it, it, the, the amount of creativity in there is just, it's, it's, uh, you can see something new every single time. Oh, yeah. And you know what I just noticed? I call it Star Wars Land. It's like back in the day when I was working there, I had to know everything by its exact name. Oh, yeah. And I love the fact that now I'm free to like, just go, I was Star Wars late. It was yeah. so much fun. Yep. <laughs> and I, I don't have to think about it in terms of, Oh, how do we, you know, right. We, it's make a long something. name too. <laughs> we used to laugh because when they were doing all the press for galaxy's edge and yeah. the ambassadors were like doing all these promo things, we always laughed because the, the ambassador, one of the two ambassadors at the time, would do all these videos and he'd be like, we're so excited for star Wars galaxy's edge. Like, and every time he said it, it was the full title. <laughs> and we met him at the D 23 expo. And I was like, just so you know, we thought it was so funny. Cause you'd always say star Wars star galaxy's, Wars, galaxy's edge. Edge. And like yes. with that, like yes. excitement of it. And I'm just like, nobody's yep. going to call it that. And nobody does. Everybody calls it star Wars land. So, yeah. You know, just like people well, call it pirates, not pirates of the Caribbean, mm-hmm. or they call it. Yeah, yeah, know, yeah, exactly. Not no, I mean, Some of these attraction yeah. names are massive. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. It's true. So Bambi kind of what what brought you to the Disney company? Like, obviously, we heard kind of your story, but like, how did you first start with the Disney company? Where did you kind of begin? You kind of alluded to it already. But I guess what was your background and stuff that put you into that? position? Well, I am. I am a, a, I was, a, I'm a record store geek. Okay. <laughs> okay. When we had record stores, yeah. remember that oh, those yeah. vinyl. They're coming yeah. back. I, I, well, yeah, but I mean, it was that, that back in the day, that's all there was. Mm-hmm. So I used to spend uh, hours and hours and hours in record stores. Like people go to the library. I went to the record store. Okay. Mm-hmm. So my first job, like cool, first 
real job in my head was I worked for a record store chain called Warehouse Records. I know them. Okay. Well, they're not, I don't think they're around anymore, but anyway, <laughs> I, I, I went to work for Warehouse. They weren't as big as Tower Records, but they were right up there. And then there was another uh, chain called Licorice Pizza. Mm. And uh, those were kind of the big three, if you will. And I thought when I got that job, I was so perfectly suited for it. Now, without knowing it, it was my love and my interest and my passion as a kid growing up. I had four, a collection of 45s. Remember, yeah. I probably don't even know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> okay. And I loved label copy. I loved album jackets. I, jackets. I loved liner notes. Mm. And I loved lyrics. And I would never in a million years at the time growing up thought that there was actually a job where that information and knowledge would be useful. Okay. <laughs> but really and truly yeah. that my love and interest and that led to my seeing an ad in one of the trade publications. There's a little Mickey icon and it said copyright assistant, music publishing, copyright assistant wanted. Mm-hmm. I answered a want ad. Yeah. People don't even know what those are anymore. But, <laughs> you know, because there's so many ways to see. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's like LinkedIn. If you saw a thing, you click on it and you apply immediately. Yeah. That's, yeah. you know, before LinkedIn, that's why we would have, tra- you know, trades that would list the job openings. And uh, I was really nervous. I applied, but I was I, I was panicked because it said copyright assistant. I thought, oh, assistant, they're going to want somebody who knows how to type like 100 words a minute. And, and if I could do 55, 60, that was, I was zooming and that <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't want to not get the job because I couldn't type. And I tell the story and I don't want to give it away because it really is in the book and mm-hmm. I, and, and it's a special story to me, but I, I'll just share with you that I called a family friend who I asked if they could let me know, you know, whether typing was going to be an important <laughs> prerequisite for my job. and. As it turned out, it wasn't, and it wouldn't have mattered because my first job was as a copyright assistant in music publishing, and I was in that job for about six months, and it was much more of a a, a lot. The skill set was for somebody who has good librarian skills, Mm -hmm. organization. Uh, It was checking, making sure copyright renewals were processed, and, and, you know, very, I'm grateful for that job because it was like learning that you better cross your T's and dot your I's Mm -hmm. and, you know, really kind of get to know the business side of music. And that's what publishing really is, kind of. And then I kind of saw where I wanted to be and what I really wanted to do. And I wanted to to create the recordings, the music. At the time, the read-along story records were really, really popular. And the cool part of it was, they were licensed. If it wasn't an actual Disney film, they, they would license, like, for example, Star Wars. And we would put out the Star Wars read along book and records or E.T. as told by Gertie or, you know, so uh, being around at that time, I knew I wanted to be over and ma- learn how to make those records. And, and that's really where I learned the production side of, of recording. I worked on. Oh, oh gosh, I think I. I, I lost count, but at one point I did count because, you, you know, it's like people do ask you, but I think I made a, I, I probably produced about 60 read along book and wow. records oh, wow. and worked on song albums, hit song albums like Mouser Size. Oh, yeah. <laughs> totally Mini and Flash Beagle. Yeah. So <laughs> that's incredible. So after your copyright assistant job, what was the next step or the next role for you? Well, in order to support our song albums, we started to go get into, you know, it's it's like, it's hard to explain, except that if you think of Mickey, Goofy, Donald, Minnie, Daisy, they're kind of like the Disney recording artists. And so they need songs for their song albums. And back then, MTV had just really exploded. and so. 
And when I say MTV, I don't mean what we know to be MTV today. Like actual it, music it was, television. <laughs> yeah. It was actually, yeah, it was actually music television. Mm-hmm. It was like 24-7 music videos yeah. all day, all night, all. So we started to look at our art, our Disney artists as recording artists that needed their own music videos. Yeah. And so where are you going to get that that footage? You know, it's animation. Mm-hmm. Well, we had quite an extensive animation library to look at and draw upon. And I really got into that. And I, I, I put together two music videos that, that wound up in regular rotation on MTV, which was really rare back then <laughs> for, you know, music. And it was for Totally Mini, the, the, the lead track from the album, and Hey Mickey. And Totally Mini was sung by an artist named Brenda Russell. And Brenda Russell is kind of now really very well known for the Color Purple, the musical. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. And she had a lot of hits in her career. I mean, just an incredible singer and wonderful human being. And then the other song was Hey Mickey. And Hey Mickey was a takeoff parody version of, in a way, of the Tony Basil song, Hey Mickey, which was popular back in, in the day. So we re-recorded it and that was sung by an incredible talent, Desiree Goyette. So I put the music videos together and they got into regular rotation. And all of a sudden I'm thinking to myself, maybe I need to leave the company to become something more than because at that point I had done a lot of song albums and and story records. So, you know, it was one of, it was one of those things where I thought, well, maybe I need to just spread my wings and try to fly and see where it takes me. Mm-hmm. So I left the record company and I was immediately hired by an independent company that was producing, that was brought on to produce the Disney sing-along songs. <laughs> so I never really, in my career, I was never not working on a Disney project, even if I wasn't on staff, I right. was still working. And while I was working on this Disney sing-along songs, I was, you know, the same producer was brought on to work on Disney television specials. I'm pretty sure it was the 50th anniversary of Disney. That was a production that Don Misher produced, very well-known producer. And I was brought on to work on that project. And one thing kind of led to another. And my former boss at the record company, had stayed at the company and had been elevated to, I think he became president of Walt Disney Television. And it included television animation, which was a relatively new division that was started at the company. And we ran into each other, literally. And he said, let's have lunch and talk and tell me what you're doing. So I filled him in and he said, well, I've been looking for you because I I actually was looking for you because We're starting a a new series and the plan is to have a song in every episode. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, wow. What's the series? He says, it's for the little mermaid. Now, this was this was back in 1990, I think, that I was having this conversation. The movie came out in 89. And so I said, I'm in. Yeah. And I was brought on and my title then was uh, associate producer music. So you might see my name on some of those early shows as associate producer music. And then from there, my career just grew and grew. And I started a whole department and had people working with me. And so I actually went back on staff with the company and and was there until my until I left. (laughs) <laughs> now you Incredible. quickly went past something but you Uh-oh. i really would like you to talk a little <laughs> bit about it because my childhood this is a you know some of my childhood here which is the sing-along oh, yep. videos uh, because yep. i tell you i i remember quite a few of these so first of all one of the things i liked about the sing-alongs was if you went and saw the movie in the theater back in the day for the, you know, kind of like what you're saying with like people who don't aren't aware of how things used to be. You had to wait sometimes almost a year 
for that movie to come out on VHS or something to see it at home, like and own it. Unlike today, where it's like forty five days or some ridiculous thing like that. But they used to hold them back for seven years. I don't know if you know that. Well, there was a yeah, period they had the time. vault thing. The yeah. releases. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The vault. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, go ahead. But yeah. um, but one of the ways that you could get the songs and parts of the movie was these sing along songs because they'd put it out shortly after the movie came out because you know as almost like a combination promotional thing. And I just remember so many, and I remember at Disneyland one, like I think you had mentioned at the Disney Anna event, the Haunted Mansion one, I think you said you had worked on that there was like a sing along or something with the Haunted Mansion in there. And so talk about that a little bit because okay. that is a I, huge part of my childhood. Okay. So I was involved in the first seven volumes. By the time they became almost a marketing tool, in a way, with what you're saying, they were tied to. Yeah. We were at in the. It was a proof of concept thing, if you think about it. When we did the first ones, it was you know there was not. It wasn't really tied to anything, and it was let's see, does this work? If teaching kids, you, you know, it, it really is a great tool to teach kids how to read. Yeah. And because you're following the words on the screen. You know, and we were trying to develop a way to do that as simply as possible. This is, you know, we're not talking about, you know, everything instant and digital and, you know, all that. This was back where it was a little more primitive, okay, in the in the early ones. I think one of the ones, for some reason, You Can Fly stands out. I did that volume. They changed the names and repackaged them over the years. So it's very, very well be could be something that you remember sure. was from something earlier that was done. But no, I was there for the the in fact, one of my favorite songwriters is a guy named Pat DeRemer. And Pat DeRemer wrote the main title theme for the Disney sing along songs. Mm. I knew Pat from my my days at the record company because he wrote the songs for Totally Mini. In fact, he wrote the main title theme that Brenda Russell sang. So, you know, there's a I call them invisible threads in my book. You'll you, you'll find you'll see that there are a lot of them in, in in how my journey has been. Not anything I could have planned, but they were all there all the time. So the sing along songs, the main title theme was really important. I had to come up with something that was going to explain it and be catchy. And then the process of the reason why I think I got the job was because as I was just explaining to you, I knew the cartoon, the animation library, because I had been cutting those DTVs. Oh. They weren't called DTVs then, but what became DTVs, those music videos together that went on MTV. And I knew where the music and effects tracks were and the, you know, and all the splits and, you know, could make suggestions on certain images and things like that. So that's how I got that job to help to develop them. But a guy named Phil Savinick and Harry Aarons were the main producers on them. And they brought me in as an associate producer and that we did seven volumes. So, wow. yeah. And you know, what's really funny that you say this because, and thank you for asking, you know, me to talk about it a little bit, because I often find that out of all the things that I've worked on, that the thing that most people would say, I see, I know, I've seen your name. I know you. Disney sing along songs. <laughs> it's weird the things that like, you know, throughout your career you could have done a ton of cool things and and people just lob onto certain things, but mm -hmm. those sing along yeah. songs, man, I tell you, I remember them fondly and I remember VHSs and I'm sure yeah, I wore them out, you know, watched them over and over. And they used to play clips of them and stuff in the Disney stores too because we'd go into the Disney store at our local mall and they'd have the little sing along songs and yep. you know, they'd play 30 seconds of one and then switch to another or whatever but i have fond memories of that that was really a foundational disney media memory for me now teresa See, and no. others make fun of me all the time because i'm not really a disney movie person i'm more of a parks person yeah. but that's one of the things that i remember from media Wait, you know this is this is gonna i mean again i'm sure your listeners are a lot younger but just for those who might be We've a little bit all older, ages we do okay mm -hmm. all right well then i'm not going to discriminate or hold back what I remember was really kind of cool was I got to meet and he was involved. He and his wife, Ginny, were involved in the in the singing group, the singing aspect of a number of the songs that the ones that had to be re-recorded. Sure. And even the main title theme was Don Grady. Now, 
you might not know that name right off the top of your your head, but Don Grady was on My Three Sons, mm. the television classic television show back in the day. Yeah. So I was kind of excited that I got, you know, back then. Yeah. And, you know, got to Oregon. So there are a lot of people that behind the scenes over the years, I just think, wow, you know, they went on to do all kinds of other things. And I like to, that information of who does what is hard to come by. And yeah. that, that was another reason why I wrote the book. I mm. wanted people to get the credit for the things that, you know, that was something I know. I, I, I fought for it, to be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. There were instances where I said, if you don't put the producer who produced the music for that or who the music supervisor, or people just going to think like there's, you know, little mice working somewhere. <laughs> right. You know? Cinderella's little animals. Helpers. Cinderella's little mice, you know, it, it was, it was kind of frustrating yeah. to, to be able to, and this, and, and I, and I'm not, I don't mean to pull the woman card, but it was really hard, honestly, yeah. being the only woman in the room in a creative capacity and i had to really you know i i tried to i tried to not let it get in the way of anything but it was a struggle you know i'm not gonna lie you know and i i i want to i want to just encourage especially young women that are interested in the in the career and and especially in the creative side of things go for it and don't let anybody tell you you can't well because it can be done yeah and it, i mean it's important because like you said Years later, people people want. I mean, maybe not the kids watching, but when adults wonder, like, well, who did this and whatever. And it's as an adult, I find it very interesting to watch credits and kind of connect the dots and be like, oh, I remember that name from this thing, or you know, it's just it's really interesting and it's important to know. Yeah, well, one of my bugaboos that I had, and funny, we were at the Disneyana convention, so you know that this one of the folks that was, was honored is the, the lovely Stacia yes. Martin. And oh God, what what an incredible woman mm -hmm. and great background and uh, things I didn't know and I've I've known her but I I didn't know you know that, <laughs> that was really a thrill but she has an incredible album collection you yeah. guys remember the okay yeah. well she put up an album cover and I went I produced that <laughs> like and and it wasn't anything that anybody would know yeah. right and it was the official the Epcot album oh. with the the, the geodesic dome you know yep. the, the yep. Okay. And I don't, my, I don't think my name appears anywhere and I'm the one that put that together. And I was like, look at that. <laughs> what a small world full circle. I, yeah. I just yeah. want to mention too, that you brought up something that we actually, we were at the Marceline event and we were talking to the Imagineer who is credited with doing the wallpaper. Oh, Tanya. Tanya, Tanya McKnight North. And it was very important to her to also talk about people that mm -hmm. had not been given credit for things. And in the talk that she had there in Marceline, she went out of her way to be like, look, we worked as a team. It was this person and that person, the other person, you know, maybe I did a sketch that was kind of like this, but I don't know. We did a lot of stuff. A lot yeah. of it was collaborative. I can't take full credit for stuff. So you saying that is, is just kind of reinforcing that, you know, there's a group of folks who have gone through this creative process in, in our case, because we're in the industry of talking about Disney stuff at the Disney company and are kind of like people should be getting credit for mm -hmm. things. And we were talking about this earlier that for a long time, nobody knew who created any of these attractions, right? Yeah. Like these Imagineers were just kind of hidden figures, <laughs> but now they're like rock stars, you know, right. Every, you know, everybody who's a Disney parks fan anyway, <laughs> knows Tony Baxter knows Don't Joe Rody. Like they know these people, but some of the original folks, you know, they had to, you know, it's just, you know, more recently have come out. So I really commend the fact that you're trying to talk about all these folks. And one other thing I really want to commend you on is you keep saying all these names off yeah. the top of your head. I can barely remember any names. So the fact that you're in a conversation, you're just like, oh, this person who's a great this and that. And you're just throwing out all these names. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't know how you do it, but it's amazing, it is amazing. that you have all of that. Well, thank you. Thank you. And thank you. <laughs> no, you know, I, I have friends that tell me my, I have a, that was another thing, you know, and again, writing a book is, you know, writing it down and pre protecting and preserving. Yeah. However, how, 
I want to encourage other people to do that. Yes. We all think that we're going to remember everything. And we all have a story. Oh, yeah. You know, we all have our stories. And I think that that was part of, you know, like I thought, well, I better really write this all down so that I, you know, don't forget it, you know? I, and and so thank you. I, I feel like, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I did. You know, it's not an exhaustive book. I don't want people to think, oh, this is a, like a memoir where I tell my whole history and I tell everything I've ever worked on. There's a lot of people, frankly, I feel bad that I maybe left out or I didn't name, but not, not be, not for any reason other than the fact that that's not what this, the intention of this book mm -hmm. is. You know, it really does go back to the fact that I make no, I take no credit for the fact that my name was Bambi and I worked at Disney. It just is what, what happened yeah. to yeah. me. Yeah. And, you know, whether it was from birth and getting the name to my best friend's father being, you know, working there and all the things that kind of connected along the way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if I can, can acknowledge other people and their contribution, that's, I'm glad to, I yeah. really am. Well, and like you said, it's important because once these stories are, forgotten they're lost and it's there's so many they go um, when we yeah, go yeah and yep. there's just so many amazing you know amazing experiences or things that have happened or little things that people are interested in but if you know if they're lost then they're just lost so it's it's really well, I, know, I love it I, i'm so happy that you did this because it helps kind of preserve and kind of let you know let future generations you know kind of take a peek behind the curtain as you said with your peak with Disneyland, but it's just, it's, it's fascinating. It really is. You know, it, it, it's something that was really interesting for me was that within the last four years in the process of between the, you know, to get a publisher to publish a book this, these days is kind of a big deal. And I, I commend the folks at university press in Mississippi for saying yes. And people ask me, well, how did you get that publisher? How'd you find them? And the, the fact is, is that I was interviewed for one of their other books 17 years ago. Jeez. Yeah. And it was a, it was an, a, a wonderful book called Mouse Tracks, which was, is the definitive book that traces the Disney records from the early days all the way up to, I think, in the, the early 90s. And that was like a book that was put together, researched. It, it's got so much information in it. And I was interviewed for that. And when I, thought about my book I thought well gosh I wonder if that publisher is still around yeah and and actually Greg Airbar who's the person who interviewed me at the Disney oh, yeah. convention he was the author of that he was the co-author of that book and so, so cool. you know it's it's yeah and and but it is really important Teresa I'm glad you said it the the protection and preservation of our stories they, when we die, they go with us. Yeah. And I was just going to say, four years ago, so many of the people I talk about in the book were still around yeah. and they're not around anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's bumming me out, yeah. you know, it, and that's just, yeah, I mean, we, we, um, you never know, you know, when some, I, I mean, we're, we've been all kind of, I think a lot of people have been very affected by Matthew Perry's passing, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. yeah. from yeah. friends. And I, I think you just don't know. And, yeah. and so, yeah, so these, for me, I, I just, I, I want to encourage people to write, write it down yeah. and find a place to share it, you yeah. know? Definitely. I also want to say, looking through the book here, for anybody who wants to read all of this history, it's only a 145 page mm -hmm. book. And I did not realize, and I apologize for not realizing this, you have a ton of photographs yes. in this book. I love that. <laughs> so it's 145 pages, but there's a lot of photos too. So I think you could easily, in you know, a couple days probably if you committed to it, could get through this book pretty easily. If you're behind or you just want a, like something that's not a giant. I mean, we have some Disney books that are hundreds of pages long. <laughs> yes, I, I know. Mm -hmm. And that's great. I, I mean, we one. need them. Yeah, but yeah. this is a great one to kind this of get This is a stocking stuffer. This there is a stocking go. stuffer. A stocking <laughs> stuffer. I love it. And I love that you included photos because I think there's something yeah. about reading it, but then also reading it and be able, being able to see what it is you're talking about really helps. I mean, for yes. me at least, really helps kind of tie it. And I just it it's that much. It's much more like that much more interesting for me. I guess. Well, say there. Yeah. I'm 
that's you're you're pointing out the nerdy geek in me because I <laughs> save every I'm a collector. No, I that's like perfect. You know, that's what we're part of the Disney tribe is we're collectors at heart. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so if I, you know, the things that I, you know, collected uh, uh, over I, I wanted to be able to uh, illustrate or, or support some of the stories. And I feel very, very fortunate that I was able to do that. And not just, you know, because I, I kind of, it bothers me. It's not like, oh, well, there's Aunt B and she's with another famous person. It's not like that. Right, yeah. It's it. I wanted it to be something that would be supplemental or support the story that I'm telling. Mm-hmm. And I think there's, I, I, I work, I'm glad you appreciate it because I really <laughs> love that. I kind of geeked out on it. Yeah. No, yeah, I, I think love, it's great. I'm with Teresa. I love like a lot of times. I mean, even on this interview, you've said things and I've like typed mm-hmm. it into the browser because I want to like see it or be reminded of it or something. And so the fact that people don't have to leave your book to <laughs> do that, they can just as they read. Oh, there's the picture. I yeah. love that. And yeah. so yeah. Oh, I think that's you. a great addition to the book. I want to talk about we got to talk about your childhood. Let's talk I about want your to talk about my childhood, my childhood was growing up and watching all of the TV series. Mm. And uh-huh. The Little Mermaid was one of them, but then also, of course, like Darkwing Duck, DuckTales, Goof Troop, what, oh, Gargoyles. My little brother was super Oof. into Gargoyles. But yeah, I oh, that, loved all that, of Do you know those. they're going to make a, gargo- a, a Gargoyles, I think, a new series yeah, or a movie? That's what mm. I heard. Did you hear about that? Based on the original. There you go. Oh, Tailspin. Yeah. I was a huge Tailspin Ship fan. Chippendale Rescue Rangers. Oh, yeah, Rescue Rangers. So many good ones. Well, you know, all the we uh, at one point in time that we joked about it being the all duck network is all the show. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, by the way, the creative, the brilliant creative guy behind all of that was a guy named Jim Magon, who was my boss, who taught me how to produce records. And Jim, he worked, he created all those, the duck shows, you know. I mean, again, there's a whole team of people, oh, but, yeah. but, that, but Jim really was. I came in, let's see, I worked my, the earliest show I worked on was The Little Mermaid because of the mm-hmm. songs and Goof Troop. Mm-hmm. That was yeah. really fun. That was my, and then everything that came after that. But like talk and about you mentioned them. songs, you know, e- yeah. even though they weren't ones that you worked on. Dark Green right. Duck, I don't, there's so many people that you say that and they instantly, the theme song pops in their head. Music is important because it does, you know, it takes you back to places and it takes you kind of lets you relive different moments of your life. Even it's almost like smell. Yeah. You know, how you smell certain things and you're taken. It's like you hear a song and yep. it takes you back. Yep. Well, you know, what's really funny about what you're saying. And I wish more studios would think about this. A lot of shows don't have main title themes anymore. No, they don't. And and what you're talking about is something we really, you know, our main title themes are usually about a minute. They yeah. they were a significant amount of time, and if you if you think about it, I think the the one of the greatest theme songs that of of contemporary theme songs of the time was Gilligan's Hi- Island mm-hmm. because Gilligan's Island told you a whole story yeah. about what the show was, and I know that we really tried to you know do that with our themes so that they would resonate either musically or lyrically or both. Or let the audience know what this what the show was going to be about. So we took a lot of time, and I had a blast casting our theme songs. Like you know, again, a lot of people maybe they'll know some of the names, but like you know, Pat Benatar sang on another Goofy movie, oh. and Eddie Money sang Quack Pack. That was oh, another wow. Dutch, <laughs> and the main title theme. And Lou Rawls, who is a legend, sang the Jungle Cubs theme. Mm. Oh, Mickey Thomas from Jefferson Starship oh, wow. sang Mighty Ducks theme. Wow. So, you know, I, I got and and again, those were folks that were probably more of my time of, you know, that I. But to be able to get to work with them was yeah. oh, thrill. I feel so, again, just so grateful that I had that that experience and that opportunity. Amazing. And then also my childhood was some of the films that we were talking about before we started the interview. A goofy movie has got to be one of my favorites. Like one of my favorites. Too, yeah. I don't. And again, the music, I like any of those songs. I could just like, it just takes you right back to like sitting on the couch as a kid with your VHS tape <laughs> going. 
having to rewind it because you're wanting to watch it again. You just can't wait for that little rewind button to go fast enough. <laughs> you know, all that stuff. And it's just, yeah, it's incredible. I love the good movie. Mm-hmm. I love, I love, I just loved everything about it. And I love that even today, the two Powerline songs. Yeah. I've heard more people re-record and do their own versions of them. Which is pretty amazing. It's in Toontown now. Did you know that? In Mickey's Toontown. It, it it's is? in the background. Oh, yes. you're kidding. It oh, is. Oh, how incredible. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. You, gotta, you kind of have to really like Last time listen. I was there, it was closed. So, yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Oh, yeah. You're going to have well, to go I'll... back there and listen because yeah, okay. I think it's eye right. to eye that they have kind of looped in Eye to eye, of course. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and then uh, make sure that you go to the little shop after you ride Mickey Minnie's Runway Railway, the little oh, exit yeah. gift shop, buy a Power Lime. It's like their little <gasps> no, candy bar. A, yeah, it's like a taffy. How? Oh, you're kidding me. Power lime. A power lime yeah. candy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's oh, like a, like hilarious. an airhead, like a taffy candy. Yeah, yeah. they're really good. It's real popular. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic. All yeah. right, I'm gonna have to tell David Z, uh, David Rivkin, who produced the power line songs. There you I go. saw him recently. We went we went to the El Cap and we went to see the. A goofy movie up on the big screen. Right. Oh, it was so much fun! It was so much fun. They had a special engagement for a week. Yeah, wow. And we went to see it. Yeah, so I have to tell them about the power lime candy. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Cool. Cool. Okay. Well, I think that if we try to talk too much more, I think people should just go read the book. I think people should just read the book. They can see the pictures. Thanks. They can get all of the stuff there. Yeah. Let's talk about the book process and how oh, sure. how did you kind of decide you wanted to do this and then kind of get everything together and talk about the journey that was creating creating part of your magic book. We Well, we talked a little bit about it earlier mm-hmm. about the fact that I wanted to find a publisher that would know what how to what to do with it. And since they had already sold and had already put out and published Mouse Tracks, which is still available, by the way, to anybody who wants to have the definitive history of the record company. It was a it was a combination of a couple of things. Again, my belief in I love stories. I mean, I think stories are so important. Stories can do so much to help and heal people and their hearts and you know, and, and bring joy and all that stuff. And we connect through our stories. And I thought, I, you know, over the years, I thought a lot about that. And, he, and, you know, when I would share my stories, other people would then say, well, you had that. And you know what? I saw and I did. And, and, and that's just at one point in time, I just I wanted to just create like a group of people that would come together and just share stories with each other. Mm. You know, you, if you want a visual, it's sort of like, let's sit around the campfire or, you know, if you think about how certain cultures would use stories and storytelling uh, as part of their communal experience. So that is, was always in the back of my mind. And then, you know, by telling my, some of mine, my, my friends used to say, God, you just have the best stories. and when we used to have something I don't know that I've talked about really was back in the day when we would have we'd get together on Monday mornings for our creative meetings to sit around and and kind of and tell about how what, what went on your over you know over your weekend and all that and I remember at one point somebody said something like well did anybody have any brushes with greatness oh. and that was kind of how that idea. I used to have more brushes with greatness than anybody else. And it wasn't by design. It just happened. And so again, about stories, it was like getting those stories, those experiences down on paper. And I sort of collected them over the years. Yeah. When it came down to it, I I thought, well, you know, I felt almost driven to like wanting to make sure that this part of because it is being part of a history of a really incredible company. I didn't want them to get lost. And so that's, that's really why. And, and again, it's not in order to make it something that I think people can relate to. It was, it's not like I wanted to write a book about like, again, it wasn't a memoir. It's not about me. You know, it's about 
if you can, and I've said this before, it's like it's told from the point of view of the fly on the wall. Mm. The book isn't about the fly. It's about the experience that happened in the, so hopefully I've told some good stories and, and that's, that's really how it came about. Kind of a labor and finding of that project. A labor, it really was. It was a labor of, thank, thank you. That's yeah. a perfect way of saying it. It was a labor of love. It was a passion project. Mm-hmm. And I love this this publisher. I, I can't say enough. Craig Gill and his, his team, uh, Lisa McMurtry, if I can just give shout outs to of folks, course. Courtney McCreary and Steve Yates, all, all great, great people, uh, very supportive. A lot of their publications are scholarly works. And this isn't necessarily fall into the natural category of that, but yet they they took a chance because they have popular culture and that's really important to them. And this certainly falls into a popular culture. Mm-hmm. And hopefully I've I've done a good job for them as well. Well, I think it definitely looked like it. And I think I'm sure there's a lot of people in our in our listeners that uh will want to pick this up and yeah. learn all about it. So Bambi, where can people get the book? Where's the best place for them to go order the book? Okay, so the the best place is Amazon. It's uh, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it at Barnes and Noble. You can get it really anywhere you buy your books, and you can get it actually now. It's on the University Press of Mississippi's website. You can get it anywhere. And by the way, it's available. A lot of people like eBooks. Mm-hmm. It's available, through, you know, the, as an eBook. Very cool. So you can get it. Yeah, so it's all downloadable. It's all there. I appreciate you guys supporting. That that means a lot to me. Thank you. Of That's, course. Of yeah. course. And Bambi, if people are interested in following what you're up to, is there some like social media or anything that they should be checking out? Well, I am not a social media person mm-hmm. by my nature because having had the name, it's 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 a funny thing, you know, but however, I do have for the book an Instagram account called part of, at part of the magic book. So if they go to at part of the magic book, I'm really enjoying it. It's an Instagram page that supplements the book. So things that I do talk about in the book, I can show visuals oh, of yeah. or. You know, and Mm -hmm. and that's also, by the way, that's where I'm going to put your the information about this podcast. So it's a way for me to communicate with an the an audience. And I talk about my mother's love of all things Disney, and I recently found a picture of her with a cutout that they used to have at the parks, where they would have the characters, and it said Minnie Mouse at the top, and it said it at Disneyland at the bottom, and she stuck her face through it. (laughs) And so I put things like that. And I also have the, the, the Matthew uh, Serrano, uh, mm-hmm. the filmmaker who did the Halix documentary. He actually put together a TikTok. No, don't ask. I'm not a TikTok. By, <laughs> my person. But there is actually a part of the magic TikTok page. And I will tell you something that shocks me to no end. There are um, over a million two hundred thousand views of one of Matthew's TikTok wow. videos of Robin Williams and talking about me in one of the projects that we worked on. Oh. So I don't want to give that away, but if people yeah. want to go and see a really cool, there's his little TikTok videos are so fabulous. And he convinced me that I should do them. And I, I, I I'm not doing any more. I, I'm, I'm done. But <laughs> the, the ones that are there will live on forever. And go. they're really, they're really fun. So there's one, by the way, Peg, there's one on the Disney sing-along songs. Oh, which you, there you go. You'll, you'll want to check out for sure. And there's there's one on Michael Jackson. There's a couple of part one and part two on Robin Williams. And I'm trying to think of what the other one is. Oh, Adina Menzel. Ooh, I mean, yeah. yeah. So I got to see her recently. That was kind of a thrill. Because I hadn't seen her in a long time. And and you may not know this. And, and I don't know if people would. But she sang on the Hercules series that we did. Really? Yes. Wow. She she was a character called Circe's, and I I think there's a picture of her or something in the mm-hmm. in on the TikTok video. So oh, wow. anyway, very cool. Yeah. So very, fun very stuff cool. to check out. So those two two places people can kind of uh, check out, and if if, if they want to write to me, they can write to me at part of the magic book 
at gmail.com. And we'll link awesome. all the social yes. media and places where people can pick up your stuff on the show notes, mm-hmm. of course, like always. All right. It comes down. Now, technically, you already worked at Disneyland or worked at Disneyland, but not for Disneyland. <laughs> but if you could work at Disneyland for Disneyland, what would you want to do? This could be a real job, made up job. What would you like to do? I, you know what? I'd I'd go out in the park as one of the characters and walk <laughs> around. And I, I can't think of anything that's better than that. You know, yeah. if you want to talk about great people watching, that's a fabulous <laughs> and 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 just the experience of the love. It's a it's it's an instant. I, I don't know. I if just think about how beautiful the world would be if you walked out of the, your door every day yeah. and somebody just like said, I love you <laughs> and ran and gave you a hug. Yep. Yeah. Very and ran and gave you a hug. You know, <laughs> it is pretty magical for sure. It is something mm-hmm. that Disney does very well. It is. It is. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Bambi, so, is, I think that is there what? anything that you would like to talk about that we did not cover before we wrap up? Oh, I mean, this was great. I really I, I, I you guys are. Again, I feel like uh, you're you're part of my Disney family, you yeah. know, of my the tribe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, and you know, and it's like I could tell, you know, you're like I love all the things that I'm oh, yeah. seeing. By the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have to say. Well, thank you so much, Bambi, for spending the evening with us and telling us all about your fun times at the Disney Company and all the different invisible threads that you've had throughout your life. If you would like to follow Bambi, we will make sure to link all of her info in our show notes, as well as where to get her new book, Part of the Magic. It's okay. I'll be the only weekly tier without an answer. Make sure you send your questions to Producer James or Producer Vern at trivia at doweekly.net. Well, welcome back to Trivia Land. I'm glad you found us through this construction that's happening next door that you keep reminding me about. But it does smell good. It does smell good. I was going to say, they're starting to work on that food over there. It's only, you know, a little over a month, uh, a little over a month away from when we'll have it ready. Yeah, I just hope there's no entertainment over there because I think I think we, we win by being like the only entertainment in the park. There oh, you go. sure. Questions I asked you this week. Where in the park can you find the home for Pfeiffer, Fiddler, and Practical? You correctly identified that it is the Three Little Pigs, and their house is indeed one of the miniatures in Storybook Land (laughs) albums. I am. He huffed, he puffed, but he didn't blow our house down, Teresa. (laughs) Thank goodness. Yeah, you almost talked yourselves into the other side. We did. Question number two was an audio clue. This was definitely a coaster kind of rumbling. Maybe you heard an iconic roar from someone named Harold. (laughs) In the background. Good job, Teresa. <laughs> the Matterhorn. Exactly right. Good job. Take. I'm glad you fell into my trap of that. Kind of could be Big Thunder. So <laughs> he lured me in. I did. I did. And I fell in hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> Question number three came from Elise K. What year was the Sword in the Stone installed? The movie came out in 1963. The attraction, this piece, was installed in 1983. Woo! I uh, found it interesting looking at this that Merlin would come out in purple robes, it seems like. Yeah. Instead of the blue that yeah. we're so accustomed to. Telling well, very you. interesting. I need to bring this back. Why Maybe. would he come out in purple? Do you know? You said, yeah, like you had. Some... No, like I had seen it. Give me yeah. your, in, give me your, give me your encyclopedia. I don't think they're going to have a picture. Of no, Merlin. but I'm curious to see <laughs> if they have a, a reason why it did that. Anyway. Got to find that king or queen of Disneyland. Because, of course, Merlin would never remember that in the show. Last question for you this week, cast member costume. It's essentially a beige work suit. Oh. Pants with a belt, matching colored shirt tucked in. Shirt tends to have one or more patches on it as well. If it's colder, cast members can throw on a beige jacket. If it's sunny, some aviator sunglasses make the look. I'm glad you caught on to my last clue, really giving it to you that we are indeed taken off with our good friend Patrick at Soren. Yes. That good means job. a perfect week for Teresa. Woo! Hopefully. Mm. Almost perfect for Tag. Super oh, close. Very close. He played he played nice to make sure one of you got a perfect week. <laughs> Maybe the listeners at home did too. Does that mean we need harder trivia questions? No. <laughs> 
Well, if you think so at home, send producer Vern and I an email. It's trivia at dlweekly.net. We will be back next week with more Disneyland news and information. Until then, go out and enjoy the parks. Thank you to our editor, Sidel, for masterfully editing this episode and making sure all the show notes are posted. Thanks, Sidel. Please remain seated until the podcast comes to a complete stop and the doors have opened. Then collect your belongings, watch your head, and step carefully from the episode. On behalf of all of our crew, thanks for traveling with us, and we hope you have a happy and memorable visit here at DL Weekly.